This is Ham Radio Now, episode 272 from the ARL and Tapper Digital Communications Conference, a geosynchronous ham radio satellite for the Americas. I'm Gary Pierce, KN4AQ, and I have retitled this episode from its original. Let's see what they what they were going to call it. Using digital communications and microwaves in amateur radio and in the amateur satellite service uh, with Michelle Thompson, W5NYV, and Dr. Robert W. McGuire, N4HY. This talk is actually going to be presented exclusively by Bob McGuire. Michelle was on her way to, to the DCC, but uh, she hadn't gotten there quite yet. And the reason I retitled it was perhaps obvious. <laughs> anyway, having seen the talk, it's mostly about a satellite coming up for ham radio. Uh, let's see. It was, um, 2015 Tapper banquet at the, uh, Hambention, Dayton Hambention. So last year that I did ham radio now episode uh, 211. It was mostly Michael Osman, 80 zero NR it was uh, going to be his talk at the, uh, at the banquet, but there was a brief uh, introductory remark by uh, the fellow that's on the screen now, Tani Ali Al-Malki from the Qatar Satellite Corporation and an, an exciting announcement on something that I had not heard of until that point. Um, in the amateur satellite realm, people who are interested in ham radio satellites, the ultimate kind of satellite that we would like to have would be a geosynchronous satellite something that sits up there like the communication satellites, the things that bring us all of our cable TV channels, just kind of hangs in the sky continuously over one spot and it could be relaying amateur radio. That would be really cool. All the satellites we've had so far have been in some kind of low earth orbit. So we see them for 10, 15 minutes. A couple of them had highly elliptical orbits so they could go way up in the sky over North America, typically or Europe and hang there for a few hours, and then they'd come rushing back down for a very low pass over the South Pole. And um, the Southern Hemisphere didn't get to see much of them. And then they'd zoom back up north. So a highly elliptical orbit was the best we could do for a satellite that would appear and give us an uh, hour's worth of continuous coverage. So uh, that's as close as we got, nothing geosynchronous. Well, this talk was about a geosynchronous ham radio satellite, and it was, um, let's see, this one here, the Sat, uh, Sat 2, and it is um, ham radio riding on a cable TV type communication satellite, but it was going to sit over... Europe in the Middle East, it was actually going to be launched by the Qatar Satellite Corporation, so it was for the Middle East, but it would have a footprint, at least for amateur radio, over um, all of Europe, getting over into Asia and all of Africa, and just this tiny little slice of the Americas and South America, the very eastern part of Brazil, and nothing covering the rest of South America, nothing covering North America at all. So... We were going, that's cool, but it doesn't cover the Americas. So we're happy for you guys over in Europe. Uh, it was going to be launched in uh, 2016, um, but it has been rescheduled for 2017. It was going to be launched toward the end of this year, but been rescheduled till Q3, third quarter of uh, 2017, so next year. And it may or may not go up at that point. Uh, you know, these things, the launch dates are kind of uh, flexible until they get really close and then they kind of lock it down. So that's going to be really exciting. It's going to be a 2 and a 2.4 gigahertz uplink, 10 gigahertz downlink. We're talking about a couple hundred kilohertz worth of uh, transponder for sideband CW modes. And then a real wide swath for digital without a lot of specificity into what the digital stuff is going to be. So like I said, it was, it was cool, but it was not in the Americas. And so last year, this announcement came along. 
Amateur radio payload could share space on a geosynchronous satellite. So, yeah, we got that announcement and not a lot of detail about it. That's some details dribbled out here and there. Well, this episode is going to have some detail. Uh, it is going to be, again, Bob McGuire, N4HY. And um, he's going to talk about what the satellite will do in this episode. It is going to be a uh, five gigahertz up, ten gigahertz down, and so, and they call that something cute in the microwave business, five and dime. Remember Kresge? For those of you anyway in the Midwest, five and dime is uh, what they call it because it's a combination of five gigahertz and the, and ten gigahertz. Uh, it is going to be all digital. It's going to have a thousand digital channels and Bob will go into detail on that. Uh, there has been some speculation, some announcement included the idea of a linear translator, like most of the other satellites did or an FM trans, uh, repeater, like many of the satellites have. It's not going to have either of those as we are looking at it right now. It's going to be all digital and Bob will give you the, de the details. So that'll be coming up in just a moment. I need to tell you about the folks who have been uh, sponsoring the, uh, the uh, video production of the Tapper Digital Communications Conference, and they begin with um, with Tapper itself. Uh, Tapper sponsors the Digital Communications Conference along with the ARL, and they do a lot of other stuff in ham radio. Everything to do with digital, digital modes, digital equipment, uh, software defined radio, originally packet radio, still a little bit of that around. So if you are interested in anything that has anything to do with ham radio in the digital domain. And if you're watching these programs, you probably know about Tapper, but stop by tapper.org, T-A-P-R.org, and maybe you would consider becoming a member. Uh, second, we are sponsored by a fellow who wants to remain anonymous. So we're not going to tell you who he is. And he's done this uh, for a couple of DCCs of the video production for DCCs. So thank you very much to him. Uh, this year, he wanted me to suggest something that you might do for the uh, uh, future of ham radio, which is to help introdu introduce or interest young people in, uh, in ham radio. And his suggestion was to maybe give a youngster a book that might get them interested in ham radio. So I did a little bit of looking around. ARRL has got a bookstore, lots of uh, books about ham radio. Most of them, you know, like the handbook and stuff, they wouldn't be appropriate to... Uh, to young hams, but they have this section for beginners and new hams, uh, license manual, <laughs> rules and regulations. I don't think I'd give that to a young fella trying to get him interested. Um, ham radio for dummies might be a good one. It's your first HF station, basic antennas. Yeah, you know, it depends on the uh, the status of the young person. If they've already got some interest in ham radio, maybe specific books like those would uh, would get them interested. Uh, they've also got a set that they call History and Adventure. I don't think the 100 Years of QST reissue would be the thing that they want, but some um, some dramatic books uh, the day after. Um, you know, some of these books down here, Zone of Iniquity is uh, by uh, uh, Ward Silver in Zero AX. That's, you know, those are, you know, that's an adventure book. So some of these could be the kind of things that would interest a young person. So consider that sort of stuff. I also took a look at the W5YI page. They've got a lot of books, mostly study manuals, things like that. I didn't see any real serious general interest books that would just kind of capture someone's imagination. But if they're already trending toward ham radio, you can consider them for especially the, the study manuals. So um, those are the, the two sponsors that I can tell you about right now. There's a third one that I'm kind of waiting for information and would hoped I would have that information by now, but I don't know what they want to promote. So this program goes out with just those two. Also Arvin's in there in the background. If I, uh, you didn't get in on the Kickstarter that helped, uh, get me down to uh, St. Petersburg, Florida and back and all the time for editing these programs. If you didn't get in on that, but you still want to help out, stop by hamradionow.tv. Click on Arvin's icon down at the bottom, and uh, you can make a contribution either through Patreon, a credit card um, contribution one time. Pat Patreon is a subscription, a buck a month or more. Uh, one time credit card, or 
you can use your PayPal account or use PayPal to make a credit card contribution. However you want to put that together. All right, that is uh, the introduction. Let us go find out about this next America's version of a, well, there's, yeah, there's one, one, one more thing I wanted to point out. Just remembered the, the, uh, um, the European Asian Middle East satellite from Qatar is going to be a geosynchronous geostationary satellite up at the 22,000 mile point over the equator that would keep it in one fixed point covering all that territory. The one we're talking about here is geosynchronous, but it's not geostationary. And for a long time, I thought they were the same thing. They both have the same elevation, or same altitude, you know, both 22,000 miles, but a geo and a geostationary satellite is a geosynchronous satellite. But there's another category of satellite that's geosynchronous that will appear in the sky over the same place, but it moves around. And I have not been able to wrap my head around how that orbit works. So maybe Jeff, AC4ZO, who's a bit of an astronomy guy, <laughs> was trying to explain it to me. I've looked at a bunch of websites. I, what I need is a model of the Earth and a satellite moving around it that explains what it's all about. But Bob McGuire will mention that it's geosynchronous, not geostationary. So for those of us on Earth, pointing antennas to it will require a little bit of movement. But you know, at least it'll always be there, apparently. But tell you what, let's get on down to St. Petersburg, Florida for the 2016 ARL and Tapper Digital Communications Conference and learn about this new satellite. Okay, so next up, we'd like to introduce Dr. Bob, otherwise known as Robert. <laughs> Don't call me late, McGuire, to dinner. Exactly. All right. You can tell. November 4, Hotel Yankee, and his talk is on using digital communications and microwaves and amateur radio and amateur satellite service. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I don't think I've given a talk at uh, DCC in a few years, and I'm glad to, glad to be back doing it. Uh, so I'm uh, at the uh, Virginia Tech. Uh, in uh, Blacksburg, Virginia, where I am the chief scientist of what's called the Hume Center for National Security and Technology. Uh, the Hume Center was formed by Ted and Karen Hume. Ted was the uh, science and technology for the Central Intelligence Agency for several years. He left the CIA, formed a company, sold the company to Kinetic, and with the money he uh, received from selling the company, he endowed the Hume Center. And the Hume Center's purpose is to um, Shanghai trick, bribe uh, students into not taking out a ton of loans, figuring that they might like science, technology, engineering, and math, and if a few of them happen to wind up in the intelligence community or the DOD or the contractors that serve them, that's all to the good because uh, it's a little hard to outsource classified technical work to China. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so <laughs> we need, uh, and Virginia Tech is a really good place for this. Virginia Tech is one of the few uh, schools I can think of that still have cadets. Uh, and uh, they are they're really, really dedicated because about 10 or 15 percent of them are ROTC. The rest of them just want to do it. So uh, there's 1,500 of them, and they march in football games. There are, there, are, there are pluses to it. They get to go to football games and march in them and uh, look spiffy in their uniforms. So Virginia Tech is kind of a unique place. Uh, it does hands-on, minds-on engineering, and for a ham who was licensed in 1964, uh, it appealed to me. So uh, I went there, and uh, one of the first things I started doing was trying to figure out if we could do satellites from there. And it just so happened, unknown to me, they had formulated the year before the space at Virginia Tech Center. So that's engineers and scientists working together to build spacecraft, use them to do science, use them for communications, use them for all sorts of things. And AMSAT now has uh, two Fox spacecraft going up 
that have uh, cameras in them built by Virginia Tech in about November, uh, except that slid right on the calendar because of the explosion in Cape Canaveral. We don't know the time yet, but when it happens, it'll happen. It'll have two cameras on board. Let's talk today about uh, the geosynchronous experimental radio hosted payload. Kayla Brosey is my student. She's a ham. Michelle Thompson's my friend, W5NYV, and I'm Bob N4HY. Kayla's KD9EZO. There's a common feature amongst people that are in the Hume Center if they're anywhere near me. The secretaries and clerical workers have amateur radio call signs. <laughs> because I also happen to be the faculty advisor for the Virginia Tech Amateur Radio Association, and pretty soon people figure out that a good way to get on my good side is to get a ham radio call sign. So we licensed 300 and almost 400 hams uh, since I got there. So, uh, yeah, great. Uh, and this could not have been done without a ham in town called Ben Williams, who is an IT person in the math department. He does the classes and gives the exams. But it was also influenced by two unknown hams, Kay and Carter Craigie, who live in Blacksburg. So just all this unknown synergies have happened to uh, turn Virginia Tech Amateur Radio Association into a kind of a big deal. Kay and Carter have helped out a lot, and it's just a really, really wonderful place to be a ham. Okay, so phase four. Phase four is what AMSAT called the satellites that are going to go to geo orbit. And we, I wanted to put a spacecraft in geo orbit because of MCOM, which, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And we were always, we've been looking for a launch opportunity since 2007 in AMSAT. When I went to Virginia Tech, I was working on a project, went out to Millennium Space Systems in El Segundo, California. <laughs> walked by a room and looked and said, that's a geo spacecraft? And it's got room on the top for antennas. So I talked to the people, we worked it out, and here we go, we have been approved to ride on that geo spacecraft to geo orbit. Okay, so first responder system, amateur radio operators and first responders uh, need communications in disaster areas, wind link and HF is one thing. But I thought it might be neat to have a very small aperture terminal, an antenna about yay big, and a little box about yay big that runs on a battery like you saw before. And you could communicate with anywhere in the hemisphere which contains North and South America. So that, and it, all it cares about is digital data. Doesn't care where it's voice, email, packets, pictures, whatever. It will be able to transmit digital data in a channelized form. And let's go over that. So that would be available seven days a week, 365.25 days a year, for approximately five guaranteed years, but everybody thinks it'll be 10. Okay, so, it, the, I'm sorry. Uh, only those, and when it goes into emergency communications mode, there'll be verification of your being allowed to have access to the spacecraft once there is a declared emergency. So it will go into, uh, if you've been in the military, you know that radars have war mode, that they don't tell the enemy how they operate all the other times, but in times of war, the radio kicks into high gear. Well, this will kick into high gear and increase the authentication required to access it so that the emergency communications that goes on on board the spacecraft will have the highest possible priority and others will be excluded if necessary. So normal operation is anybody that's a ham can use it. And we will go a little bit over how that will be accomplished. So uh, they'll be authorized through a logbook of the world kind of approach because we don't want Captain Midnight sending porno through my spacecraft. Okay, so <laughs> that would not be good for anyone. Okay, so let's, here's a disaster area and so there'll be a link to the spacecraft and a link to, say, P25 devices using Uli's uh, dongle, okay, so for example. And it goes through the spacecraft and back down to the disaster coordinators 
who this says this has HTs, but it's likely to be internet computers. So they can be sending email to each other, looking at pictures, having digital voice vocoding going on. So that is the goal. Through this pipe, FDM up, PDM down will be data. And we'll tell you how that's going to be organized. So DVB S2X is an international standard for which there's lots of software now and including uh, uh, ASICs, which can do the job, and we are looking at ASICs and software, trying to evaluate what is the best possible way for you users on the ground to be able to talk to the spacecraft. There are uh, concatenated codes on here. These are fancy names for how do I keep the, all, the always present bit errors from corrupting the communications. So these are really, really weak signals. We're talking about five watts going 35,000 miles to a spacecraft, being demodulated successfully. It would not be successful if we did not introduce redundancy in the data that the spacecraft can figure out using some mathematical techniques which are, com which are bundled together in a thing called forward error correction and correct those errors, say, okay, I got it, that's good, I can retransmit it down to the ground. Okay, and so we're going to go over how that will go. So it's adaptive coding and modulation. So the better the signal, the hot, faster the data can be. If it's a weak, weak signal, the, the forward error correction will be cranked up and your data rate will go down. So it's adaptive to the, to, uh, to, so you can always kind of get through. Uh, and it will be using BPSK, QPSK, and 8PSK for the adaptive uh, modulation. Uh, so we're going to use power amplifier and saturation on board the spacecraft. Why would I use power amplifier and saturation? Efficiency. The spacecraft power is everything. And what happens if I have a low efficient power amplifier? It throws off heat. If I throw off heat, I have to get rid of it. There's not a fan to move the air around in space. <laughs> So you have to hook it to a cold plate and radiate it to space. You have to radiate it to space. That's the only way to cool it. So the less heat you generate, the less that has to be radiated to space. Now, the spacecraft has solar panels. If you have solar panels, they have a fixed amount of power they can generate. So the less power you consume, the less power they have to give you and the happier they are to allow you to ride share on their spacecraft. So a system engineer for a hosted payload says, how can I have the lowest size, the lowest weight, and the lowest power consumption so they will be the happiest they can be? And then they go, Are your, is your radio emissions going to clobber my toys? And then we have to go through all of that. Okay, so we're going to do frequency division multiplex going up. So these are small channels going up on bunches of different frequencies. So we have a plan for what we think we can do. There's a fallback from there, which is easy to do, but I'll go over that. So you will have a bunch of channelized frequencies to go up to the spacecraft. You will listen to the spacecraft, and it will tell you which uh, it will listen to all these channels at the same time and figure out which one you're on, okay? And there will be a map that's always being transmitted down so that if you're listening to the spacecraft, you won't be able to transmit until you can listen. Once you see this map, you will find an unassigned channel and use it. That's all automated. So you will listen. You'll be told where are the clear channels. You will transmit it in a clear channel, and there you'll go from there. Okay, so with a 10 megahertz uplink, there'll be 1,000 10 kilohertz channels. Now, this uh, sounds somewhat limiting, but I'm going to elaborate. Right now, we're going to have a try, try to do 1,000 10 kilohertz channels. That's more than enough for uh, uh, forward error correction and vocoder. If we use uh, Dave Rowe's uh, uh, Codec 2 vocoder, you, that this will, be, this, this will be overkill down at 1,200 bits per second. So I could do uh, four times as much uh, encoding and so that any er bit errors will be uh, decoded easily. Even with 35,000 mile links. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of the plan. There will be three control channels telling you, like I said, 
the uh, which channels are free, telemetry, so, uh, how, how well is the payload working, uh, other touch points, how hot is the amplifier that I have, do I need to, do I need to be a little bit more careful because my amplifier is running a little bit hot, those kinds of things. And then seven totally random access channels that just anybody can transmit on. Maybe Captain Midnight will go over there and try to send porn before I turn him off. Okay. What are the other 90 channels? They're for, for users. They're, those are the user channels. I, did, did say, she should have said 900. Yeah, 900. I was, oh, I'm sorry. This is a typo. That should be 990. Thank you. Thank, I'm very sorry. That is a typo. Thank you for catching it. Okay, so the goal of the AMSAT, so the spacecraft hosted payload is a Virginia Tech project. The ground station task is an AMSAT project. So the goal of AMSAT phase four ground is to produce an ensemble of open source designs doing what they are euphemistically calling the five and dime payload. Five gigahertz up, 10 gigahertz down. Uh, GEO is one of the first of these payloads. Now that might sound weird or how do I do it? But I'm going to tell you, you can go to eBay today and spend about $300 and put it together. So for those of you who don't want to go to eBay and put it together for $300, uh, Flex Radio and other companies are looking at how they can manufacture a device. And I'm going to stop this for just a minute and hop to a different place because what I want to show you is why I might do that. I went to the administrator of the Federal Emergency Management Administration, Craig Fugate, who is a ham, and I told him we would like to use this geosynchronous spacecraft with this hosted payload on it to help you with emergency communications. This is the blog from March 7th of 2016, where FEMA said, if you build it, we will use it. So uh, the, for them, we're building a hundred of the uh, manufactured units. The hundred manufactured units will go to the American Radio Relay League, and they will put one in each of the hundred FEMA go kits they maintain at all times. So this will become a standard piece of the ARRL's FEMA package. And it will be available for use in fires along the West Coast, hurricanes along the, uh, any coastline in America, and other disasters where the infrastructure has been completely destroyed. Many people do not understand Part 97.4 of the Federal Communications Commission regulations governing amateur radio. Let us suppose that all infrastructure for communications is destroyed. Under those circumstances, what are amateur radio operators allowed to do? Anything and everything, including what would otherwise be illegal if we did it today, that's talk to the police and the fire chief on their frequencies using their standards and relay it through our spacecraft. So that's exactly what is being built into the ground terminal. I'll be able to tune it to the police bands and the fire bands or the emergency responder bands and use P25 and talk to them directly and relay their, relay their communications through our spacecraft. If they have computers there nearby where they're kind of coordinating the activities of all the local first responders, the computers can hook Wi-Fi through my spacecraft back to the command. Okay, so that's the idea, is we are going to support first responders using whatever they're using. So right now what goes on is they have to buy a separate device to carry into a disaster zone, and, they, it, it, and it is not cheap. So this is how can amateur radio operators help the nation respond to emergencies when the infrastructure has collapsed without having to spend a lot of money on extra equipment and most local governments, state governments, do not have all the money needed to adequately equip these first responders. We are enabling amateur radio, we hope if all goes well, with the ability to dramatically impact their ability to communicate. Uh, so uh, we 
we know, uh, for example, that in the state of Washington last year, there were uh, first responders fighting fires, and their equipment did not work. And it did not, they were not able to see the relay. And they were trapped for hours out of communications, and the fire got to them, and they were killed. They must have gone through unbelievable hell that last hour while they were burning to death. So this is my uh, obsession to get this going. And it has been since I went to Ground Zero in 2001. Okay, so let me go back to my slides. It's a good thing. ARRL and FEMA and, and Virginia Tech and AMSAT all got in a room in the, uh, the administrator's conference room, and we agreed to all jointly work on this together. Okay, so uh, terminals, uh, the, the terminals are space-capable, DVB-S2X, terrestrially capable, DVB-T2. That, what does that mean? Well, why have it only work on spacecraft? It's on the ground. Why not allow you to use it on the ground? So you're going to be able to swap modes because it's a software-defined radio, so you're going to be able to swap it into DVB-T2 and uh, use it on the ground. The reason for a different mode, if I'm pointing up to space, what's between me and the spacecraft? A whole lot of space and a little bit of ionosphere, but not much. If I point it along the ground, what's between me and the receiver? Trees, buildings, multipath, all that other stuff. So you have to have extra sauce in here to take care of multipath and other crap that's on the ground, okay? So that stuff is built into DVB-T2. So DVB-S2X for space is a much easier thing to implement, but we're also going to implement T2 because what we're hoping is that five and dime will be used for all sorts of things on the ground. And five and dime does not have to stay five and dime. The, the re, there's a reason for that, which I will go into later. So you can do homebrew uh, with, the, the, with a few hundred dollars in parts off of eBay that I've told you. So the, DVB, the, uh, the LMBs for 10 gigahertz that are available on eBay, you can buy them and use them. They'll work. And Tom Clark has been working on this for quite a while. So we're going to build up for, uh, com commonly available modules uh, with, with your home brewing. Hack RFs, Lime SDRs, whatever. I don't, uh, probably even an RTL SDR will work with the right stuff in front of it. So Caleb, okay, so uh, the manufactured solution. So we're currently working with Flex Radio and Alice Kit. Uh, the Flex Radio folks and I have had a, what, 12 year relationship? I can't believe it's been 12 years, wow. Okay, so uh, many of you may know that uh, I, I was a uh, part of the team that put together Power SDR, and Tapper and others have taken Power SDR and now use them for the open uh, HP SDR, and that Gerald and I were architects for the uh, Flex 6000 series. The original block diagrams around which the Flex 6000 were based, Gerald and I sat in a room and drew them on a board. That's what you call the architect. What that means is somebody else had to take these goofy ideas and suffer like crazy over a keyboard for hours and hours while tearing their hair out, which I did 40 years ago, so I don't have any more. And they work hard and get it together, and now it's like, what, number one on the Sherwood Engineering table, and K9CT is winning contests with it, so all that work has come, turned out well. All right, so. Uh, RF NOC and GNU radio is standard implementation for each terminal. RF NOC is RF network on chip, and GNU radio is an open source software defined radio toolkit. And out of it, you can build all sorts of software defined radios by opening up a program, taking blocks and putting on the blocks like assembling a puzzle. And if you put the blocks in the right order after you assemble the puzzle, a radio comes out. You click go and it automatically generates the code. You don't even have to know how to code. All you gotta do is know how to put the blocks together. The problem is each of these blocks has what are called nuisance parameters. <laughs> these nuisance parameters are a big nuisance if you don't know what they are. And so if you don't know what they are, you're gonna have to find a 
subject matter expert, or some of you, to tell you what those nuisance parameters are, and then you can do it. The nice thing about GNU Radio is it's free. You need to download it, and it will run on Windows, OS X, and Linux. Almost all of the developers develop in Linux, but it's ported to every platform I can think of that uh, most people use. Okay, so GNU Radio enables awesome customizations, and I do that every day for a living for uh, commercial and the United States government. So if you want to get involved in the ground terminal uh, operation, please find Michelle in W5NYV after she arrives today, and you will find that uh, tomorrow will be uh, entertaining. Okay, so anyway, so for the transponder, Virginia Tech is taking the lead with help from AMSAT volunteers, the total package, antennas, thermal design, packaging, power budget, et cetera. And let me go to something different because I want you to have some URLs. If you will go to www.hume.vt.edu slash geo, you will see everything that we have been allowed to publish on this. Let me go to this. So this is what you really want to go to. So this is the page for Amateur Radio Geostationary uh, Satellite at Hume. And it includes the, pl the preliminary design review, the design for the uh, uh, radios and things. I need to do, give some credits here. So let me uh, go back. Did everybody get that URL? Okay, let me go back to the slides. And... Uh, so I can give some credit where credit's due. Who's after the E-D-U, G-E-O? Is there a slash there? There's a slash, G-E-O. Okay. Yep. Got it? All right. So let's look at this again. Here is a channelizer. So I have all these receivers coming into a piece of coding that's done on an FPGA, and it is a channelizer. This is a piece of mathematical magic that is well understood by those of us who do digital signal processing for a living. And in each of these channels, when they come out of the channelizer, the first thing I do is detect. So you're going to, oh, with your little ground terminal, send a burst, a packet burst to the spacecraft, and this thing's job is to detect that you sent it. After you detect that you, uh, I can detect you, I'm going to send you over to a demodulator. Now, not every channel of the thousand channels will be used most of the time. So I'm going to send over ones over to the demod, only the ones that are being used, how, just, uh, and I'll give you why, but all of them could be used simultaneously. There's no restriction, but we don't want to do that unless required because what am I trying to reduce? Power, because if I crank them all, not all thousand of them up, the power consumption goes up, okay? And so these are repackaged. After I rip off the framing structure, your data, you don't need that framing structure going down, that's a waste, right? So I take it, put it in a new deal to send down to the ground. The new deal I send down to the ground is one really fast stream. And what you get in there, rather than a channel, is you get a time slot. So the time, the, what gets sent down to the spacecraft is one, one signal at 10 gigahertz in the downlink. And it is time division multiplex. So if channel zero is received coming up, it'll come down in time slot zero, and so on. If channel N is received coming up, it'll go down in time slot N. And uh, so you, you will have a, that is one of the reasons for needing a dish and all sorts of fancy forward error correction in the chips on the ground. Okay. Rencon Research in Tucson, Arizona was founded by Mike Parker, KT7D. Mike Parker and a bunch of the rest of us were in the first dozen or so people in Tapper. And uh, you can see, if you go look at any of the 25th anniversary pictures of the Tapper anniversary of the 25th year, you'll find me, Mike Parker, and a bunch of others uh, standing next to each other in the group photo. Mike is the least known, what one of the most important national assets you are never likely to have heard of. 
uh, because the Rencon research does tremendous work for the United States government. And that's as far as we will go there. But he volunteered a space-rated, software-defined radio for use in this transponder free of charge. They did all the non-recurring engineering. They gave us the initial software load, and that is a picture of the device that is in my lab. This is space-rated, ready to go, takes lots and lots of killer ads, and won't fold up over years and years and years in the space environment. The parts that go on here are not commercial off the shelf. They are really, really expensive, and he has given this to us. So uh, that, in return for that, he gets to say, we did it. And not only that, after five years, they get to say, see, we told you it would last five or more years because it has lasted five or more years. That's called space heritage. In the space business, experience in orbit is everything. If you do not have it, almost no one will fly what you give them. And Rencon is a major deal. Okay, so at the heart of it is the Zinc 7045. This is a system on a chip. It's an ARM processor with four cores and some fancy SIMD stuff called, that do floating point, like your uh, SIMD registers in your Intel chip. Our, the ARMs have a SIMD thing called ne NEON. But attached intimately to this ARM is a floating point gate array. And the floating point gate array on this was fairly large. That's what the 45 means, is it's big. Uh, and on that, we can do all sorts of fancy stuff, including de de uh, find, channelize, detect, demodulate, and package a thousand channels of digital communications all at once. And that's about the lowest power way I can get a software-defined radio. The, there is a way to get lower power, and that's commonly called an ASIC. So that is not software-defined, that's manufactured and done forever. <laughs> Once you have an ASIC, you cannot reprogram it, but you can get lower power. But they are hideously expensive to have made for you. So this is a compromise for space that does what we needed to do, which is experimentation. Because in this, when we get to send the thing up, we're going to allow you hams to experiment with code loads. We're going to put it in a facility where you can load your own code and do stuff. Okay, so hook, this is hooked to an analog device 9361. The analog device 9361 is an RF integrated circuit. This RF integrated circuit hooked to this fancy software defined uh, digital signal processing computer will tune from 50, 70 megahertz thereabouts all the way to 6 gigahertz with really good performance. So uh, that's big. And it will do 50 megahertz of bandwidth, and I don't need 50 megahertz. I need about 10. Okay, so uh, I have in this NAND flash all the code that's necessary to get the thing up and running at launch. Everything else into this RAM I can load from the ground after it's up. So this will turn on and say I'm alive and give telemetry. I'm ready for you to load code, and every time I want to do new code, I will upload it here. There is a receiver, which will go, oh, which the design of which you will never know, which will allow me to reset uh, this computer with a Control-Alt-Delete that only I will know. And so the Control-Alt-Delete will happen when the thing blows up, because all computers do, and uh, I will Control-Alt-Delete, reload it, and we'll go again. And if we come up with new software or find a bug in the old, we'll control alt delete and reload it and now we'll have new software. We expect over time for this code to get better and better and better with more and more capabilities. The high reliability power supplies, the higher reliability uh, 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 storage, and this biz business right here, the error correction coding on the, the memory the random access memory, those are all things that Rencon is expert at doing and have done for us. Okay, so the VT ground station was funded. It is one of the best ground stations operated by a university anywhere in the world. Uh, Moorhead has a better one. The University of Surrey has a better one. Uh, but we have a really good one and we are growing fast. 
Uh, so all code being developed on the Edis Research X310, B210, and E310. Uh, uh, Matt Edis is an amateur radio uh, operator. He has been at the Digital Communications Conference many times. He regularly came to the, uh, the Tapper booth during the early days at, the, uh, at Dayton. And, uh, and the first code will be developed on these things before we try to put them on the Rencon research thing because these, these can be shipped around the country. The Astro SDR won't leave my office. <laughs> okay, so the FPGA code that's running on the, uh, FP, uh, the 7045 FPGA is being donated by AHA Incorporated. AHA is a, believe it or not, is a corporation in Moscow, Idaho, and they do FPGA code amongst any other thing, many other things. And they have generously donated the hardest part of this work, which is the forward error correction coding, the LDPC and the, and the block coding, the concatenated codes they have donated. And a student of mine went up there, funded by Edis, and the funded by Edis code is wrapped in RF NOC, which was done by Edis, and runs on the Edis hardware. And Edis generously funded this work because he wanted it done for his, for his devices. And that has been done, and we are grateful to AHA and Edis Research for funding this work and helping educate a student. Okay, these are the people I have to thank. AMSAT is being useful. The Hume Center is where I work. Space at Virginia Tech is where all the engineers and I do space engineering, space science, et cetera, together. Rencon Research did the Astro SDR. Millennium Space Systems is the constructor of the GEO bus that will be uh, carrying this uh, uh, up as of now. Uh, the American Radio Relay League has been extremely helpful in uh, getting together the FEMA uh, bunch and the internal people dealing with emergency communications at the AWRL are supportive. Uh, the Aerospace and Ocean Engineering Department is where many of the students come from. Edis Research, as I said, has been instrumental in getting code on the spacecraft. Uh, and with that, we get two questions. Uh, Bob, what's the time frame and schedule for construction, configuration, testing, and deployment? Okay, that's, that's an excellent question. Originally, when we started, it was breakneck. It was like, can I possibly get it done? Uh, government does some things well and some things it doesn't do well. So we are not the primary payload on the spacecraft. And unfortunately for all of all concerned, the original developer of the primary payload for the spacecraft uh, was, was unable to complete the job. So this has been recompeted and a new contractor has been selected by the United States government for the primary payload that is still under construction. The minute they are ready to integrate, on that day, I must be ready to integrate. So I need about six to nine months to finish completely the payload, include, including the uh, run it into a vacuum, get it hot and cold and shake the devil out of it to make sure it won't fall apart and break their spacecraft. That's called shake and bake or thermal vacuum and vibration testing. Shake and bake is what all the steely-eyed rocket men call it, but it's thermal vacuum. That means put it in a vacuum and cycle the temperatures and then put it on a humongous speaker and shake the crap out of it uh, so that it won't, it won't fly apart and break their toys. Okay, so that, all that process, build, code, test will take me about nine months. And you will see on the GEO page, if you're feeling very, very generous, a place where you can donate to help make this happen. Any, next question. Did I answer your question completely? I, oh, I'm sorry. I, right now, I can't tell you what it is, but I think it's under a year. Yes. Paul, KA5FPT. There was a recent announcement which you called the five and dime being put in lunar orbit. Do you know much about that? I do. We are participating in the CubeSat Challenge. The CubeSat Challenge is being done with Ragnarok, and that is AMSAT is the interface, but there, there's, a, there's an issue that will require Virginia Tech to be involved. Uh, 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 some things that are going to go into outer space are, have to be acquired by, from U.S. companies, 
And the, the things that are being acquired from U.S. companies have dual use. That means they can be used for military applications. If they are, to be, if they are usable in military applications, they are on the United States munitions list. If they are on the United States munitions list, they are regulated by ITAR, the international trade in, in, on items that might need to be embargoed. AMSAT is incapable of dealing with ITAR. I deal with ITAR every day of my life. Okay, so we have a, a security facility, a, an organization that manages ITAR, and I have locked doors behind which ITAR stuff can be held. And so AMSAT is going to work with Ragnarok to get the thing together, but this last piece that has to go on there, which is absolutely critical, is ITAR, and I will be handling that with them. Okay, so the Quest challenge is take your spacecraft, put it on the brand new capsule that will be launched on the United Launch Alliance uh, soon, blast its way around the moon, and send back data. That group, which can send back the most data after it's gone well past the moon, will win I don't know, it's a bunch of money, millions of dollars, million dollars, something like that. It's a challenge. Uh, and for that, for that challenge, there's an award. But wouldn't it be cool to have your CubeSat on the first spacecraft to leave Earth orbit and go to another uh, a body that is intended to carry men? It will not carry men or women in it, but it's intended to. Uh, but it'll go past the moon and beyond, and it will, the spacecraft will be popped off. Some of the spacecraft will try for their million dollars by entering orbit around the moon. The spacecraft that we are going to work on is trying to send back the most data from well beyond the moon. If we send back the most data from well beyond the moon, we will get the big, great big prize, okay? But AMSAT, Virginia Tech, and Ragnarok are putting this together, and you can see on the NASA page that Ragnarok has made it to the next round. We are still going, yep. Yes. Yes, Mike, KG4DSG. Um, at the AMSAT uh, forum at Dayton this year, they talked about a different channel structure. They were talking about 100 by uh, 100. You said 1,000 by 10. Is there going to be variability in the channel structure? That's an excellent, that is an excellent question. And is there going to be a capability for bonding? Yeah, that, that, that is an excellent question, and it's easily answered. So the polyphase filter bank channelizer structure that I told you, divides the, the frequency band into a thousand channels. Right behind that, I can easily put, and it's already in the code, a polyphase filter bank synthesizer. So I can put N of those channels together where N is any number between two and a thousand. And so that will go back together and I can have variable chunks put together. So for, so for example, I don't need that anymore. So for example, uh, I can put together, say, 20 of them and let you send digital video. Now, if you want to send, if, almost surely the American Radio Relay League will want to do video broadcasts. Okay, so eventually. So the problem with a big wide channel sending lots of data is, what do you think? Power. Power. You've got to have a big old honking antenna. Okay, I mean, it's got to be a big antenna to take a bunch of channels and get it through successfully. Or you could have multiplex, say, 20 of these little channels and do them all in parallel. So how this is to be done is going to cost more money, but the answer is yes. You'd have to have 10 ground terminals or a big antenna. Okay? But the great question. Thank you for asking. Any more? Yes. Uh, he needs the microphone. I have to be quick and loud. What was the diameter of the receiving antenna? 60 centimeters. 15 centimeters. 60. 60 centimeters. Two, two feet. Two and a, two, a little over two feet. Uh, Dick Bishop, uh, W4NWD. My question was the diameter of the receiving antenna. Yes, the transceiving antenna is uh, 60 centimeters. That's like a very small aperture terminal uh, uh, that you can go, direct TV dish will work. Okay, so now the thing we are arguing about and are trying to engineer is you're only needing one of them. That means the feed has to be dual band. We have some designs 
They look good on paper. Some of them have been partially engineered, but we need to test it so that uh, you do not, uh, to see if they have sufficient isolation between the two. Because I don't want the transmitter interfering with the receiver. If not, you'll need two of them, one for each band. Yeah, Kai, K-E-4-P-T. Uh, you mentioned the orbit was uh, geosynchronous. Yes. Is it also geostationary? It is not on the no. Millennium. Okay, so uh, I am in negotiations with another entity of the United States government uh, that regularly launches geostationary spacecraft with a camera that uh, looks for hurricanes. So you might figure out what that agency is. Okay, so uh, those are geostationary, and they, this is a natural partner since it's dealing with natural disasters caused by weather, and those negotiations have not concluded, so I will not say anything more than hint. But the initial response is extremely positive. So my goal is design this, get one up, and after that turn it into an enterprise. Have more than one go up, and eventually I'd like to ring the earth with them. And uh, Inmarsat and Intelsat and Orbital ATK that build spacecraft for all of them, which is a Virginia corporation, which uh, where, where Virginia Tech is, has uh, been very, very interesting to talk to about how to get these payloads on board. Okay, so I'm not stopping with one, if I can help it. Yeah, yes. Tony, W4, TAS, uh, with a 60-centimeter dish, how much uplink power will you need? Well, and, we think and about five a, watts. Will it be linear or... Uh, It'll uh, be very nonlinear. Very nonlinear. Very nonlinear. Again, I don't want you to deplete the battery in an emergency operation. So if it's nonlinear, I can make it highly efficient, and your battery will last longer. So the TDM link, uh, what's the rate on that? And it's 10 megabits a second right now. Uh, we're going to figure out exactly. So after the antennas, the power amplifiers, the everything is glued together, I will test, test the link, and I will see whether or not it will support 10 megabits a second. So there's a difference between theoretical and practical. That's one of the best things these students will learn is what works in MATLAB and on paper and in an Excel spreadsheet is a whole lot different from a piece of analog hardware. <laughs> Wally Ritchie, WU1Y. Is there any provision on the uplink to mix TDM and F FDM? There is not as of now, but this is a software-defined radio. So it could potentially, could, you could have I, a software I am open to and... all sorts of experimentation. Now, uh, let me, uh, one more caveat. Uh, I am paid by Virginia Tech. Can I operate the spacecraft? No. no, because the amateur satellite service must be run by amateurs, so I cannot operate it. The American Radio Relay League and AMSAT will operate the spacecraft. I'm the system engineer, along with John Black, of the faculty at Virginia Tech, and we may have some influence over AMSAT and the AWRL, but they will be the final determining units about what is actually done. Thank you. Great. Thank you Thank very you. much. Yep.